So, I'm going to re-preach the sermon that Tim preached here today. Uh, and, and you'll see the similarities. The title of my sermon today is Salvation. And I'm going to begin with my conclusions. The, the good news and the bad news in a nutshell here. If you'll just let me make four statements to kind of summarize this thing. And this may seem elementary for many of you, but I think every once in a while we need to just go back to the beginning and say, what is this really all about? And this next season of Acts 2 Ministries is, is going to see many people come to salvation for the first time. Those of us who've been around and had a relationship with God a long time, sometimes forget how good we have it. The person who hears the Gospel but doesn't think they need saving are eternally sentenced to death by their arrogance. The person who doesn't think they're worth saving are eternally sentenced to death because they're believing the lies of their own shame or the lies of the enemy. Maybe more accurately, they just don't understand the love of God. The person who thinks that they can save themselves by being very good has made the cross of Jesus Christ of none effect. But the person who believes in the work of Jesus Christ and enters into and maintains a relationship with Jesus Christ according to Scripture, will rejoice with unspeakable joy today. Anybody happy today? They'll enjoy the benefits of living a clean life and they will ultimately obtain eternal salvation for their souls. The good news is that unlike most things in life, salvation doesn't depend, as Brother Trembley said, on how smart or rich or beautiful or popular or competent you are. Uh, this has st stood out to me lately. We live in a society where everybody's screaming unfair. Wall Street is greedy. The politicians are crooked. Everybody's shafting me. Poor me. I don't have the money. I don't have the connections. Everything is rigged against me. Have you heard that lately? Even the, the wealthiest among us are saying everything's rigged against them. This is something that nobody can take away from you. This is something that nobody can rig. This is something that you can have. And absolutely nobody but your own thinking or your own pride or your own fears can steal it from you. So, what is salvation? And how are we saved? I want to start with that and I feel like for a few weeks I may be talking about similar subjects so you and I are refreshed in our understanding of what this is all about. So we can get excited about what's happened in us, but so we can care about some folks out there who are looking for what God has already given us. So I'm going to begin in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6-9. through 9, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, get this, my faith is precious. It's not saying my salvation is precious. It's saying my ability to believe in God is precious. It's more precious than gold. You know how precious gold is? Gold is going for about $18,000 a pound now. Have you ever heard the phrase, he's worth his weight in gold? Now, my weight in gold is $4.7 million. If I ate a good meal, it'll be even more this afternoon. <laughs> Though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen ye love, our love for Him causes us to choose Him again and again because we love Him, because He loves us. In whom though ye now see Him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with unspeakable, 
excuse me, joy unspeakable. Say those two words, joy unspeakable. Uh, Brother Petoskey spoke to our ministry, Connecticut ministry at our ministers and wives retreat, and he said that he's happy, but sometimes he forgets to tell his face. Sometimes I, I, I have his joy, but sometimes I forget to tell myself that. Sometimes I just forget to be happy. And I'm not trying to force you to be happy right now. Some of you are just smiling accidentally or whatever, but uh, as Christians, you can't really go about faking it because everybody knows when you're faking it. But you can, really, uh, you can really have everything you need and not appreciate it. It's unspeakable joy. Joy unspeakable and full of glory, though, the song says. Receiving the end of your faith, end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. In other words, when I get done loving Him and choosing Him again and again and again, when I have run my race, then I will enjoy that salvation. I enjoy it now. I'm saved right now today. But, but ultimately, I could let go of my salvation at any point. So, I have to be diligent all the way. I'm saved but I'm not, it's not one of these things like the phrase goes, once saved, always saved. It's not like I come to Him and I say one day, I believe in you, and He says, boom, you're saved. Now go be an idiot and do whatever you want and treat me however you want and treat other people however you want and we'll get to heaven and have a great time. No, He's saying, no, I'm inviting you to be my child and you need to be my child all the way till you die. And when you die, you're going to come be with me in our heavenly home together and it's going to be awesome there. I, I, I am so glad that He found me. I'm so glad that He allowed me to experience that new birth. I'm saved today and I'm going to, I'm going to treasure this so the day I die, I can walk into that eternal salvation with Him forever. Would you thank Him for His salvation? Thank you, Jesus, for Your goodness. Thank You for Your salvation. Thank You for what You've done, God. Thank You for buying this for us, for purchasing this, for making this possible, Jesus. Hallelujah. You may be seated. So what is salvation? What does it mean to be saved? been a lot of discussion, a lot of argument over this for years and years. As you know around here, the final word is the word. Around here, if there's ever an argument about anything, and what it means, we have to go to the source book, the Word of God. What does the Word of God say for it? Uh, it, it? It really doesn't matter how brilliant I am or how many schematics I can come up with and how I can paint this picture and what I think is going to happen. That's just me. I could be insane. I, I could miss it. But His Word... It's forever settled in heaven and it teaches us. So think about it. Maybe you haven't stopped to think about this lately, but what are we being saved from? And how does it really work? Is, it, is salvation what God does or salvation what I do? Everyone say yes. That's the answer. Are we saved by grace? Are we saved by faith? We're saved by grace through faith. So we live in a world where there's all kinds of churches and all kinds of theologies, and some of them have focused over here on we're saved by grace. And, it, and they, they tell us how much Jesus loves us, and I'm glad they do, and He does love us. And he, it, it, they say things like Brother Tremley said, which is right, He bought me. I didn't deserve it. His grace reached down for me. And, and so... Salvation comes by a merciful, graceful, loving God. But Scripture says, by grace, through faith. And that faith is what I bring to the table, and that faith is more precious than gold, according to Scripture. So let me, let me give you a quick illustration. It's like food. Food is what gives me nutrition, right? That's where I don't give myself the nutrition. The food gives the nutrition. But peas on the table don't give me nutrition. Peas in my stomach give me nutrition. So I have to take the food and I have to appropriate it to my body in order to benefit from what is there. 
God comes along with this so great salvation and He offers it to me. Uh, he puts it on the table. He, he sometimes has a preacher spice it up, make it like, yeah, I think I want to try that. And then we have to decide, am I going to partake of it? Am I going to live in that? I can eat today and I'll be okay for a few days. But I can't once eat, always eat. A once eat, always full. It doesn't happen that way. It's a relationship I have with food. I eat daily. I eat multiple times a day. I don't miss. Usually, if, if my body starts saying I'm hungry, I'm there. Now, spiritually speaking, do we do that? Why does the preacher always say, don't miss church, don't miss church, don't miss church? Because that's a, a place to eat. And you can have your own personal relationship with God, but usually if left to yourself and you don't have all the body of Christ, you'll overbalance. You'll get your little candy stick and you'll get stuck on one theme your whole life. You'll never learn, you'll never grow in any of the other areas because no one's pushing you. You just, you'll think of one thing and you'll get one concept and that's, all of life will be about that one concept. But when you come to church... Uh, you know, someone will say, you've been eating crackers for 32 days now. How about putting some cheese on the crackers? See how that tastes. And you know, you've been getting headaches because you don't have a balanced diet. You've been, you've been eating a lot of meat. How about a little bit of vegetables here? A little balance. So the words translated salvation in the Bible. In the Old Testament, there's three or four words. In the New Testament, there's only one word. Uh, in other words, the Hebrew has four words that can mean salvation, and the Greek only has one. But in the Old Testament, these four words are translated into salvation in the King James Version 150 times. In the New Testament, salvation is mentioned 50 times. So 200 times the Bible talks about salvation. It's a pretty important theme in the Bible. Few people, according to Jesus, are going to be saved. Jesus says... Salvation is awesome and salvation is here and I'm, I'm here to declare to the world the good news. I'm here to tell everybody this is great news. But most of you guys are too stubborn or proud or pig-headed or you know, whitewashed walls or whatever else Jesus used to say not very many people are going to be saved not because God doesn't love everybody but because not everybody wants to be loved God's way. The two biggest reasons that people will not be saved are not the devil and the world. The two biggest reasons are pride and unbelief. So my two biggest enemies are potentially right between my ears. And really, the devil and the world are only playing on that. Really, the choice is right here. The devil can't make me go to hell. The world can't make me to go, go to hell. It's only if I allow my unbelief or my pride to say, I just am not going to buy into that thing. You Go get dunked in the water to have your sins taken away. That's so silly. I'm not going to do that. Pray until I talk in a language that I don't even understand, speaking in tongues, that is so out there. I don't, I'm not going to do that. And, and so they disqualify themselves not because they're not good enough, but because they're just not willing to do it God's way. And if you have kids, you have a child that wants to go do something, but they don't want to do it your way, what happens? For most of you, you're wise enough to just not let the tail wag the dog. Your toddler does not run the house. If your toddler wants to go have fun tomorrow, they have some things to do today. God's the same way. He loves us, but He's not stupid. He loves us, but He's not... He has R-E-S-P-E-C-T. So, later on in First Peter, which we're going to read more about, Jesus refers to... Him as our Lord and Savior. That's a good way to remember. He is my Savior. He is my Lord. He, he saves me. He rules in my life. He's loving. He's, he's 
powerful. He is my heavenly Father. He is my King of kings. He is my gentle Redeemer. He is the judge who sends people to hell. It's all true. So you can't be saved if He's not your Savior, and you can't be saved if He's not your Lord. It's that Lordship that causes many people to go into doctrines that tickle their ears. When we come to Lordship, like, let me just ruin the sermon real quick, throw in a few words, like submission, and holiness, righteous living, and obedience. When you start preaching those kind of things, you'll thin out a congregation real quick. You'll ruin a good TV ministry that way. Now, if I preach, send me your money and you'll get rich, well, I can talk a lot of people into that. So can Walmart or so can, you know, a lot of people buy into that. But when I say pick up your cross and die to your own desires, and that's the greatest way to find happiness, when I say giving is better than receiving, our brains go... Doesn't compute. And we lose all the joy of giving because we... When, when someone preaches a sermon and says, you've been offended, you know how to fix that offense? Forgive him. It's like, boy, that's, that's backwards. That, that guy must be naive or something. And so we don't forgive and we don't enjoy the life that God has for us because we've got bitterness and we've got anger and we've, we're, all, we're always upset and we're saying, God, why am I so upset? And he says, well, I, I told you how to get rid of that. It's lordship. I feel a whole sermon coming on about lordship, so I'm going to move right along here. Talk about salvation. Holman's illustrated dictionary defines salvation like this. One idea of salvation involves three notions. First is the rescue from danger, harm, or even death of an individual, group, or nation. Most specifically, salvation is the rescue from sin and death. Second is the renewing of the spirit. Scripture explains that humanity fell from original conditions of moral purity into a state of sin. God's salvation always renews the spirit of a person to lead a life that's morally pleasing to Him. Third is the restoration of right relationship with God. One of the effects of sin is separation from God. The written Word of God makes it clear that salvation restores one's relationship with God. As Romans 5.10 says, For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. In both the Old Testament and New Testament, God's salvation includes rescue, renewal, and restoration. Does that sound like God is trying to tell us something here? It's exactly what Brother Tremblay summarized. Peter said in Acts 4 that there's salvation in no other name but what? Jesus. The transliteration of the Hebrew Name Jesus, which is Yeshua, Jeshua, is really Jehovah is salvation. So Jesus' story is the salvation story. Our story is the salvation story. The story of the church is the salvation story. When Simeon saw Jesus in the altar, he said, in the temple rather, he said, Now I can die, Lord, because I've seen your salvation. So the enemies of your salvation again are Satan and the world, but the world system that Satan's been able to co-opt and Satan are, are simply trying to take advantage of the real power, which is between your ears, your flesh, your choices. Now, there's two ways that he'll get you. One is if he can get you to be super carnal. If you can be so carnal that you let your own whims and wishes carry the day. I know Jesus said, don't do this, but I'm going to do this anyway. I know that it's not good for my relationship with Jesus to stay away from Him for, for long periods of time, but I have things to do, so uh, you know, forget Him. He's a boyfriend that can wait. It's, it's when you, you're, you have a relationship with God and then you kind of let it be cheapened, like when men start calling their wife, woman, or my old lady. It's cheapened. It's no longer powerful. It's no longer 
fresh and good and loving. It's cheapened. So we can be carnally minded, and that's what we preach about most of the time. Don't drink, don't smoke, don't cuss, don't go do things that are wrong, don't kill, don't steal, don't, all of that kind of stuff. But there's another way that you can lose your salvation, or another way the enemy can steal your salvation, and that's by making you super spiritual. God gives you a gift, and you start focusing on, oh, I've got discernment. Oh, I can hear from God. God talks to me. Well, goody, goody, goody. He talks to anybody who will listen. He talks to the rocks. He talks to the, you know, he talks to animals. I'm glad he's talking to you and I'm glad you're hearing, but don't get too puffed up about that. You don't have the tiger by the tail and God's not going to, he's not going to talk to you so much so that you can just float through life and everybody else, all these poor unspiritual people are not led by the Spirit. That's pride. He'll get you just as fast that way as getting you to sleep with your neighbor. So if He loves you, He sends things along to just yank the rug out from underneath you and to where you, the, your, your giftings aren't working anymore. And you, you pray, but you don't hear God anymore because He's trying to keep you from resting in your gifts or your abilities or that super spiritualness. Like, you're not saving yourself. I don't care if you talk to angels. I don't care if they come have supper with you. That's not what saves you. Have visions. Good. Be Spirit-led. That's good. We're supposed to be led by Him, but it's a relationship. It, and, and our flesh wants to grab hold of that and be a guru. Our flesh wants to grab hold of that and super spirituality makes us look at other people like, you, you know, poor you. Me and God, we have, boy, we're tight. But when I go to prayer group, everybody else is so carnal. Everybody else is so, they just miss it and all that. You're probably in worse shape than the guy who's got liquor on his breath sitting there trying to touch God that night. Because salvation is get over yourself and let Him be your Savior. And most of us will not get over ourselves. And that's what keeps us from being saved. I don't care, again, if you can't get over yourself because you, you don't want to stop sleeping around or you don't want to stop killing people or whatever your sin is. It's just as bad when you don't want to realize and admit your weakness. When you, start realize, when you start relying on how good you are, you're in just as bad a shape as the guy who won't be good. Well, I didn't mean to go that far, but you know that was, that was God's loving words to somebody here today. You and I have to come to this thing. There's, there's an offensive doctrine. that There's a, even a lot of theologians that blast this. And, and that's when we say, I'm born in sin and shape and in iniquity, and I have a sinful nature. And there's, there's whole churches and whole groups of people who just hate that doctrine. And they won't say sinful nature. We don't have a sinful nature. But when He finds us, we're blind. We're poor. We're slaves to sin. We need saving. We're destined for hell. We're going to be eternally lost. That's where we start. I don't care if you're good. I don't care if your grandpa was the founder of a church of some kind. It doesn't really matter that you gave all your money to the poor or you gave your body to be burned. If you don't have the love of God, if you don't, if you don't start here, I am weak. You're strong. I am a sinner. If you don't start on your knees, if you don't start with repentance, if you don't start by admitting to God and everybody, that's the reason we encourage people to do, do baptism as public as possible. Because this is you bringing your flesh before everybody and saying, I admit I am poor. I am weak. I am a slave. If He does not ransom me, I am a goner. But thank God I know the good news. Thank God I have a name that I can call on. Thank God that salvation is available to me. Jesus has paid the price. All we have to do is choose a life of joy, choose a life of purpose, choose a life of holiness. It's a choice. It's a daily choice. But the door to salvation is disguised. There's this huge golden bejeweled door over here saying, this is life. Life is if you could be a movie star. Life is if you could live in the Bahamas. Life is if you could not have to work. Life is... 
And, and it looks like the way to life. And over here is an old beat up, scratched up, skinny thing. You doesn't even look like you can get through it. It's salvation. And few there be that go in there at. God didn't just offer us freedom from slavery. Slavery, He offered us the opportunity to be His children. It's one thing to, to get free from slavery. Like, you're no longer a slave, now you're free. But to go to the, the, the house of the Master and to have His ring on your finger and His robe on your back. There's no self-righteous in that. You still smell the pigs on you. Like the prodigal. You look down at the ring and you say, I can't believe He gave that to me. You look at the robe He put on and you say, I'm not righteous. and I'm not pretending to be righteous, but I have a righteousness that He gives to me. I'm not righteous because I pray three hours a day. So I'm not righteous because I hear voices. I'm not righteous because I speak in tongues. I'm not righteous because I do this, this, and this, and this. I'm not righteous because I'm better than you. I am righteous because I've been to the cross and I've told Him, I need this. I, I need Your blood. I need You to forgive me. Thank You for that righteousness. Thank Thank you for that goodness. I, I went there one day and then I went there the next day. And I came back there this morning and I'll be back there tomorrow. Every day of my life, I, I'm going to be in this relationship with him like that. Let me give you a little bit of a tip. And it's interesting that my illustration is also about cars. It's a little bit different illustration. But see, there's many passages in the Bible that talk about salvation. I mentioned it's mentioned 200 times just by that word. But different passages in the Scripture complement one another. Sometimes if you take one passage, it sounds like it's saying something very different than it is in another passage. So you have to take both of those Scriptures and figure out how they work together. I'm going to give you an example of that by using my vehicle that I have. I have a, a, a Jeep Cherokee. We bought it a couple of years ago, right? Let me tell you what my Jeep, about my Jeep Cher Cherokee. My Jeep Cherokee is costly. My Jeep Cherokee is affordable. It's an off-the-road vehicle. I've never been off the road much with it. It's an on-the-road vehicle. It's an all-wheel drive. It's late model but it's not brand new. It's fuel efficient, but it's not the most fuel efficient. It's a gift from God, but I paid for it. Are you hearing me? It's a good deal. It's one of the most expensive things I've purchased. It's a, it's a large vehicle. It's a small SUV. It's one of the best vehicles I've ever owned. It's not the best vehicle I've ever owned. It's mine. It belongs to my wife. Every one of those statements are true. And I have to bring them all together to really get a picture of what they're all like. So, someone will grab onto a passage of Scripture that says, confess the Lord with your mouth and you'll be saved. And they'll say, salvation all I have to do is confess I'm saved boom and then there'll be a passage over here that says something that seems to be very different like Jesus saying if you're not baptized you're damned it's like whoa I thought it was confession not baptism no now I'm confused well everything is like that you can take anything and say things like I did about the vehicle it's still true. It can be new, but not brand new. It can be mine. It can be my wife's at the same time. So our texts explain that faith that I have is going to be tried, tested. But that I can have joy even while I'm being tested, which doesn't compute. Because I know that the end of my faith, that the end result of my faith is going to be the salvation of my soul. Now, instead of, instead of bringing a bunch of different places in Scripture together today and making it fit for salvation, 
I'm going to do something else. I'm going to go read a passage of Scripture, and that passage of Scripture is going to seem to say different things, and we're, we're not going to go from all over the Bible, but just that one passage of Scripture is going to have to all fit together. And I'm going to have to understand salvation like Peter said to understand it. Now, let me give you a little context. We're, we're reading from 1 Peter, which is an, a letter written by Peter to the church. Now, some people... There's been some argument whether P- Peter wrote the letter or not, but most scholars, conservative scholars would say Peter wrote this letter. Most scholars would say that he wrote it late in his life when he was probably the bishop of Antioch or the bishop of Rome. Uh, evidently, Peter kind of became the leader of the church, or at least one of the major leaders. James might have led in Jerusalem and Peter led in Rome. Eventually, as you know, Rome became the center of Christianity. So Peter was a big deal. That's why the Catholic Church claimed him as their first bishop or their first pope. So here's the guy who preached the very first sermon on the day of Pentecost, first sermon of the church, who writes a letter about when he's going to die. What's important about this is Most scholars, again, will at least agree, even if they don't think Peter wrote it, they agree that it was one of the last letters to be written. So Paul has already written everything, and Peter has been able to read what Paul said, and now Peter's going to write something too. He's not contradicting Paul. Many people misunderstand some of Paul's teaching, because one minute he'll say, you're saved by grace, and forget the law. But then he'll turn around in another chapter, and boy, will he lay down the law. So it's like, well, what is it? And, and, and that's where we need to understand what law he's talking about. We're, we're moving on from the law of the Old Testament, ritualistic law, but we don't ever leave the law, God's law. God, always, He's the ruler. He's the king. If He has no rules, then He's not a king. It's like you've heard lately, if we don't have borders, we're not a country. If we don't have laws, we're not a nation. If the kingdom of God doesn't have rules, then it's, be, it's meaningless. If anybody, everybody goes to heaven, then what's heaven? If Jesus just lets anybody do what they want to do, then what's the point of a Jesus? You know, it's like, well, okay. Evidently, he's out there somewhere doing his own thing. But, but salvation has a much different take from Scripture. So, I said all that for those of you that might hear what I'm about to say and argue with it. You're not arguing with me. Who are you arguing with? St. Peter, Bishop of Rome. You're arguing with a guy who was crucified upside down, a guy who was with Jesus, a guy who preached the first sermon that was preached to the church, a guy who was respected enough to be the, the leader, at least of all the churches in Rome where people were being killed for their faith. And this is what he said. I'm going to read 1 Peter chapters, chapter 1, verses 3-20 through 20 from the New Living Translation. Now, all of you people... Uh, have long attention spans, right? Because uh, nowadays we're getting longer and longer attention spans. Uh, and, and so I know I'm going to cover 17 verses here. Uh, it's kind of going to be a lot of information. So punch your neighbor and just say, stay awake here. We're, we're going to get the meat of this thing. I'm going to read a couple of scriptures. I'm going to throw in a few comments and I'm going to move right along. But I because I don't have time to make all the comments that could be made. But if you want to know what salvation is, if you want to know what it is to be a Christian, if you want to see Christianity in a nutshell, this is a passage. These 17 verses will do that for you, all right? Verse 3, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's by His great mercy that we have been born again. Anybody been born again? Because God raised Jesus from the dead. Now we live with great expectations. Anybody have that? Expecting good things? Being born again, as you, most of you know, is to be born of the water and the Spirit. It's repentance, it's baptism, and God giving us the power of the Holy Ghost. That allows us to live this life of salvation with great expectation. If not, if you don't have great expectation in your life, maybe you're not really enjoying your salvation like you could. If you don't have joy unspeakable, maybe... You've been paying more attention to other things than to the most precious thing God has given you in your life. If you died today, you'd be in heaven. 
That's the most precious thing that you can have in your life. We can be confident in our salvation not because it's a done deal. It's not like one day I made a deal with God and that deal is so powerful that nothing can take it away from me. The reason my salvation cannot be taken away from me is because I've decided it's not going to be taken away from me. And He's going to be my help. If I'll let Him, He'll help me no matter how my faith is tried. But if, if the doctrine that once I'm saved, I'm always saved were true, what would be the point of a trial? Why would my faith even need to be tried? If, if I said to my wife 35 years ago, 37 years ago now when we were uh, dating, if I said I love you and I never said it again, what kind of relationship would that be? Like, yeah, I said I loved you, it was sealed, now we're, we're loved forever. That wouldn't be any kind of a marriage. Marriage is about every day saying you love them. It's about fresh kisses. It's about hugs. It's about uh, fights and making up. It's about uh, all, all kinds of relationship going on there. And salvation, if we're not careful, we dumb it down to a one-time experience. Like, I said one day that I love God and boom, it's over. No, this is, a, this is an eternal relationship. He, he wants you to enter into this eternal relationship with Him. And it, it is secure in the sense, as, a, as long as you value that, as long as you don't divorce Him, you're going to be married. But it's not so secure that you can kick him in the teeth and he'll just say, okay, I'll take it. I'm a, I, you're right, I'm wrong. I'll take the beating. He took a beating on Calvary to buy our salvation, but he's not taking beatings anymore from his children. He's not taking beatings from those who love him. So all of you that think he loves you so much that he doesn't care whether you go to church or not or how you dress or how you act, you don't respect him. You're a bum taking what you can get and not giving anything. You're selfish and it's a, it's a rotten formula for a, a relationship. How can he have a relationship with you when you do all the taking? Was that clear enough? I'm talking salvation. I'm talking about joy unspeakable. I'm talking about great expectations here. And he says in verse 4, we have a priceless inheritance. An inheritance that's kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. I mentioned the other day that I had a gun that I bought when I was in Montana so I could hunt deer. And then I went to Texas and deer hunting was kind of... I didn't like sitting in a tree waiting for the deer to come to the salt lick to kill him. So I stopped hunting. I stuck my gun away, hadn't shot it ever since I've been in Texas, I moved from Texas, so it hadn't been shot in like 25 years. Well, my son begins hunting out in Oregon, and so I wanted to send it to him, and I took it in to see if the guy could ship it, and he basically said, it's so decayed, you might as well throw it away. But not my salvation. Nothing can mess with my salvation. My inheritance isn't even down here. My inheritance is in the bank of heaven. Uh, nothing can steal it. The, the, the government couldn't take it away from me. Nobody could be mean enough to me to make me lose my inheritance. The only thing that would cause me to lose my inheritance is if I decide not to be his son anymore. If I run away from home, I lose my inheritance. But nobody took my inheritance away. I left my inheritance. So I can be happy when everything's trying to take my inheritance away because I know that if I value my inheritance enough, nothing will ever be able to take it away. Nothing can take you out. You can't lose the battle you're in if you just have the desire to go there. God will give you the strength somehow. Now, you may have to make some tough choices. You may have to decide which you want more. And that's the scary point. Because if you ever value anything more than your relationship with God, you can bow out. You can divorce God. Just because you were married doesn't mean you're still married today. The relationship has to be cared for. It has to be treasured. It has to be a, a daily relationship that's happened. And verse 5 says, And through your faith, God is protecting you by His power until... Would you say until? 
I'm, I'm making a point here because there's a lot of people that teach my salvation is done deal. But Peter's saying, my inheritance is safe until I receive my salvation, which is ready to be revealed in the last day for all to see. So, be truly glad. There's wonderful joy ahead, even though you have to endure many trials for a while. This is a picture of Christianity. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. Right now, whatever's trying to get you to choose it over God is only proving how much you love God. If you'll just kick that thing out of your life, once more it'll be proven. I love Him more than I love anything else. He is more precious to me than anything else. Including your pet doctrine. Including your pet prayer. What if God came to you with this option? Dennis, you can have absolutely anything you pray for. But, I mean anything. The Ferrari that was mentioned. You could drive out of the showroom with that, but you can't go to heaven. What do you can choose? Well, everybody said, duh. And yet there's these penny candies that some of us are sometimes choosing over God. So be truly glad. There's wonderful joy ahead even though you have to endure many trials for a while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It's being tested as fire tests and purifies gold though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through the many trials, I will bring you, excuse me, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Christ is revealed to the whole world. This is just a test. Help me with that. Turn to your neighbor and say, this is just a test. It's just a test that will prove how much you love Him. All you have to do is live through the test. Verse 8 says, You love Him even though you've never seen Him. Though you do not see Him, now you trust Him. And you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting Him will be the salvation of your souls. God does the saving, but my salvation is only going to be fulfilled if I appropriate it through faith and obedience. Is this making sense to everybody? It may seem so simple, it's like, oh, I know all this, but I'm telling you there are doctrines out there that, go to, that get the very middle of this out. Verse 10 says, this salvation was something even the prophets wanted to know more about when they prophesied about this gracious salvation prepared for you. They wondered what time or situation the Spirit of Christ within them was talking about when He told them in advance about Christ's suffering, His glory afterward. They were told that their messages were not for themselves, but for you. And now this good news has been announced to you by those who preached in the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. It's all so wonderful, and even the angels are eagerly watching these things happen. We think... Seeing an angel would be an awesome experience. Now, some of you in this room have seen angels in the Spirit. I don't know very many of you that have felt like there's been a physical manifestation of an angel in your room. Maybe a few of you. But most of us secretly wish that would happen sometime. Like, Whoa, wouldn't that be awesome? And, and the angels are saying, yeah, I, if God had me manifest in your room, that'd be a pretty neat experience. But I wish... I could experience what you have to be saved. I was made like this. I couldn't help it. He, he just made, I was made an angel. I just had to be an angel. But you have the, this relationship where he, he takes you out of the miry clay and he takes you out of the junkyard and he restores you and he, he refreshes you. And you, all, all you do is cooperate with it. You, it's not because you're so great. It's just because you cooperate with it. They would like to look into it. So... Peter says, think clearly and exercise self-control. Everyone say exercise self-control. If salvation were a one-time boom experience, why do I need self-control? It is... I, I get married... When I got married, it was a one-time experience. Right? My wedding was a one-time experience. So, in a sense, when I got married... 
It was May of 1982. So I can look to a day. Now, I wouldn't impress her very much if in 1983 I looked up an old girlfriend and spent a few months with her and 1984, I moved to Australia and, and uh, spent three or four or five years down there having my life. And then, every, then I come back to her. She's getting mad right now even as I'm talking about that. Just... <laughs> so when the Bible says we are his bride, when the Bible talks about him being our father and our being his children, it's all about relationships. What, how does it make sense that, you know, 20 years ago, I got saved. I don't go to church anymore. I don't really pray. I don't really talk to God very much. But I'm saved. Bunk. You had an experience. You walked down the aisle, but you haven't been the partner you ought to be. You don't have a relationship just because one day, you know. If I got married 35 years ago and, and didn't spend any time with my wife since, we wouldn't be celebrating our anniversary in May. Not together. Not in a happy way. So salvation requires self-control, not because I'm earning my salvation, but because I've entered into a relationship and I have to maintain that relationship. So I look forward to the gracious salvation that comes because I'm exercising my self-control. Verse 13. Verse 14 says, So you must live as God's obedient children. What? I thought, I thought he saved me and once I got saved, everything was kosher, hunky-dory, happy-go-lucky. Our flesh wants to say, I want it to be a one-time experience, then I can go on and do whatever I want. And God's saying, the whole idea of being saved is so you can have a better life. If you just get married and then you don't live married, you don't enjoy the benefits of marriage. If you just become a Christian one day, but you don't live like a Christian, you're missing all the joy, you're missing all the relationship, you're missing the whole point. So what you talked in tongues once? All that means is for a few minutes you let the Holy Ghost move through you so powerfully that He had complete control. But if He hasn't had complete control in your life for six years, you don't have much of a relationship going there, do you? You don't go back and earn it. You just say, I choose relationship. I, I'm just choosing to be in relationship with Him. It's not like he's, he's deciding whether He loves me or not by how many hoops I jump through, but I have to be willing to have a relationship with Him. I have to be the one to say, yes, God, I choose you. Verse 15 says, but now you must be holy in everything you do just as God who chose you is holy. For the Scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. Now this holiness isn't something that I do. It's something that happens because I'm in relationship with Him. And remember that the Heavenly Father to whom you pray has no favorites. Now listen to this. He will judge or reward you according to what you do. So you must live in reverent fear of Him for your time as foreigners is in the land. In the land excuse me. I, I, I've been reading the book that... Uh, was loaned to me by Patty, good or God. And in that book, John Bevere takes a chapter or two to talk about how he's not Pentecostal, he's not UPC anyway. He talks about how m most Christian, Christians in America are not living true Christianity because they bought into the theology that God's grace saved me and so there's no commitment that I need to make in my life. So they have no holiness in their life because they're not willing to love Him that much. So, they bought into one little scripture over here that says, by grace I'm saved. And they've missed all these scriptures like Peter's saying right here. You're going to be judged according to what you do. That doesn't mean that my doing is what saved me, but my doing is what allows Him to save me. So, even though He bought my salvation, I'm going to be judged as to what I did with that. If you're arguing with me right now, you're arguing with Peter, right? Or go home and read it again in several translations and argue on your own time if that's something you need to do until you work through it. Come to terms with it. 
Last three verses. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And the ransom He paid was not mere gold or silver. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose Him as your ransom long before the world began, but He has now revealed Him to you in these last days. Would you stand with me? In 1956, a man by the name of Harry DeLair of Long Island, he was a writing instructor, he went to Pennsylvania to an auction looking for some horses that he could buy and then train students on. He got there late. All the good horses had been taken. And so the only ones left were the, the ones that no one would bid on. And they were being loaded into trucks to be taken to slaughter. And the story goes that he made eye contact with this big gray horse. And he just, it, it just something happened there. It just connected. And so he offered the slaughter house truck driver $80 for him. He was eight years old on his way to die. And Harry said, eight dollars. They named him Snowman. Took him home. Found out he was, he was a very gentle horse and good for riding, but he liked to jump. In fact, Harry went through some hard times, so he actually had to sell Snowman to his neighbor. And his neighbor took him home, and the next day, Snowman was back at Harry's. He jumped all the fences. So they took him back, and the next day, Snowman was back at Harry's. So, I don't know what happened, but, you know, for Harry, it kind of became a special thing. Like, he loved his horse. Started taking him to shows, and Snowman started winning. People called him the Cinderella horse, because... In 1958, he won the Triple Crown, uh, the American Horse Shows Association Horse of the Year, Professional Horseman Association Champion, and the Champion of Madison, Madison Square Garden Diamond Jubilee. He appeared on To Tell the Truth, Who Do You Trust with Johnny Carson? He had his own fan club. He was profiled twice in Life magazine and was the subject of three best-selling books, including the two, 2011 New York Times bestseller, the $80 champion. He retired from competition in 1962 to Harry's Farm in Long Island where he lived until he died in 1974. And he was inducted into the jumping, Show Jumping Hall of Fame in 1992. He was worth $80 when Harry found him. He was worth millions of dollars when he died. God took an old car, fixed it up. Harry took an old horse and fixed it up. He paid a ransom. Historically, the greatest ransom ever paid was for Atahualpa by the Incas in 1532 in Peru. It constituted a, 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 a hall full of gold and silver which today would be worth $1.5 billion dollars. I wasn't worth that much when he found me. But he took the most precious thing he had, that spotless lamb, the blood, and he applied it to my life. And next time I think about saying, oh, Jesus loves me. He's a good God. He doesn't care if I do that. I need to ask myself, did he give me his blood? And I just threw it in the closet. Yeah, his blood. Jesus, Jesus died for me. Do I value it? Because I'll guarantee you, even though God is loving, He's like my wife. He's not just going to keep loving me and chasing me. And, 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 and if, if He chases
kicked me down and said, I bought you with a price and I want you to go to heaven and no matter what you do, I'm going to keep bailing you out. Suddenly, it would become clear that you were God, not him. God is loving, but in our day, we've lost the fear of God. And we've lost an appreciation for what that salvation is. And so we've got a Maserati in the back shed collecting dust because we don't even realize what we have. I'm challenging you. If you have not accepted this great salvation, <clears throat> it's not a one-day event. <clears throat> it's a relationship that if you'll step into it, it'll be the richest, it'll be the most precious thing on this planet. But when you die, it will be forever and ever and ever and ever. And it's free. Because it's free in the sense that you don't pay for it, you may not value it. But it's really not free in the sense that if you don't value it, it won't be the end of your life. We have a habit of preaching funerals and sending everybody to hell. I think we do everybody a disservice when we do that. Not every nice person is going to hell. Your niceties don't take you to heaven. Excuse me, not, not every nice person is going to heaven. And I don't know who is and who isn't. And we don't have to be afraid that we're not going unless we're not being wholehearted in our relationship with God. So what I'm saying is we do have a security in our salvation if we're playing with a full deck if we're being completely honest with God, if we truly value Him and we're doing our best, then it doesn't matter what kind of trials we come to. We're going to get through it. God's going to give us the power. I, I'm going to make it to the finish line. The only thing that can keep me from crossing the line and having my eternal salvation is if something talks me out of it along the way. So I'll close by reading the passage preached by the same guy who wrote 1 Peter. Pentecostals may get tired of hearing this, but it's the plan of salvation. And it, it's really the simplest, most concise plan of salvation in Scripture, and that's Acts 2.37 and 38. I'm going to read it from the Amplified Version. Now when they heard this, they were stung, cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, who were special messengers, Brethren, what do we do? And... <clears throat> That, that question could really be rephrased, what do we do to be saved? Peter answered them, repent. Change your views and purpose, would you say purpose, to accept the will of God in your inner selves instead of rejecting it. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of and release from your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. He didn't say... Oh, God loves everybody. Everybody's going to heaven. Don't worry about it. Did he? Because he had too much respect for God. He had too much respect for what he just witnessed, the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. So he said, if you want to be a part of this, it, anybody can be a part of this, but you have to swallow your pride and you have to climb over fear and you have to push past the world and you have to forget about all those other things that are trying to get you into other relationships, and you have to decide <clears throat> his relationship is more important to me than anything else. And if I'll be faithful, there's absolutely nothing that can touch my inheritance. Nobody can take it away. That's salvation. I wonder if we could just all come to the front, not pray for one another today, but just pray our own prayer to God. God, I don't want to disrespect You. I don't want to assume... That just because I had a, a, a few experiences with you in life that my relationship with you is what it should be. I want to respect you and I want to value my relationship with you that if I do, I will be able to... to my faith will survive every temptation and my inheritance will be laid up for me and my end will be salvation. Would you thank Him for His salvation? Would you recommit to that salvation, God? If you need to repent right now, repent. If you haven't received the Holy Ghost,